Hey, everybody. So we're making our way through a few technical things. Um, welcome to the Female Eye panel discussion where activism meets cinema. I'm really excited about this. For those of you who don't know the Female Eye, we are an annual international competitive women's film festival. Uh, our, we take place, it's our 21st edition in June uh, 2023 at Tifba Lightbox, June 8th to the 11th. And I'm really excited to say that we'll be presenting all three films. Um, we'll be with the filmmakers today. We'll be presenting their trailer, having a conversation with them and an audience Q&A at the end of the panel. Um, but we will be um, in, in going deep it, without me spoiling anyone's film, spoiler alert, because I'm used to doing interviews with directors after we've shown their films. The Female Eye historically has presented films on International Women's Day, um, but this year we just raised our fists on uh, IWD on March the 8th in solidarity with women around the world um, seeking freedom and uh, rights. But when I found out this year is that International Women's Day is not just a one-day event. There is International Women's Month. So I was very excited about that as were the team and the board and we decided to forge ahead and uh, host a couple of panels this month and this is the first of two. So without further ado, um, I would like to bring uh, our panelists up on the stage as it were, the virtual stage. So uh, if we could do that, that would be great. Thank you so much. I see, ah, hello. How are you doing, Habibata? Hello, I'm good. How are you? Good. You had me. I was frightened. I was wondering, where did she go? You were there and then you were gone. So I was thinking there was possibly a problem, but it's really great to have both of you here. I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to just sort of give a little snippet of, of who you are. And Sharin uh, informed us that she will not be able to join us sadly, uh, but she sent a video um, that she has asked us to share with her, her contribution to the panel. So what I thought we would do is I'll do a brief int introduction to the two of you. Then if you don't mind, I'm going to present uh, Sharin's video message to us and to the audience, and then we'll run the trailer to the film that is about her courage and defiance. Um, so I'll start with you guys. I have to put my glasses on. Sorry, I can't remember everything. Uh, Phyllis Ellis is the writer, director of Category Woman. She is no stranger to independent cinema. She's worked in India, Africa, Asia, and the US as a writer, director, actor, and producer for the last 35 years. Her work addresses themes of justice, truth, transformation, and human rights. Her, late, her last feature, Toxic Beauty, was nominated for an international Emmy. She won the Canadian Academy Screen Award. Her awards and accolades for her films are numerous. Um, if you wanna find out more about her, you can go to the Female Eye Film Festival website, or I'm sure you can find her online. What you might not know about Phyllis Ellis is that she's an Olympian field hockey player, and she played in the Summer Olympics of 1984. We're going to be talking about your film with you. Uh, Cora Moose, so big sister, marks um, Habi Bada Warm's uh, debut feature documentary. It was co directed by Jim Donovan. Habi Bada is a survivor of FGM and an activist who is leading the charge to, in opposition of this practice. She sits on the board of RAFIQ, an NGO for immigrant and racialized women in Quebec and was recently awarded a creation grant, I learned, uh, from the Canada Council of the Arts for her next film. So congratulations on that. And I'll have you talk about that a little bit when we come back. So we're gonna start with Sharin because she is not she is not here, um, as I mentioned. So Sharin Ibadi is a former judge. She is the first Muslim woman to have received a Nobel Peace Prize. She is now, an activist defending women and children against the brutal regime in Iran. Shirin Abadi, Until We Are Free, is directed by Don 
Gifford Engel, and it tells the story of Shiran's courage and defiance in the hope of bringing justice to the people of Iran. So without further ado, uh, why don't we run the, um, why don't we run the, 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 the interview uh, that Shirin pre-taped for us, pre-recorded for us, and the trailer. Thank you. As for her, Shirin Abadi Asam, film that Dost Azizam Don Sakhde Omidwaram مورد پسند شما باشه و الهام بخش باشه ما و شما مسئولیت مشترکی داریم آگاهی و آموزش حقوق جهانی زنان از اینکه در این زمینه تلاش میکنید سپاسگزارم و من مایلم که اطلاعاتی در خصوص جنبش زنان و انقلاب فمینیستی در ایران با شما صحبت کنم. به دنبال کشته شدن دختر جوانی به نام محسا در سال 2022 در ماه سپتامبر انقل... علت قطع این بود که چند تارمو بیرون بود و مبورین حکومتی او رو کشتند. این مانند کبریتی بود که به بشکه بارود کشیده شد و باعث شروع انقلابی شد که انتهای آن سقوط رژیمه شعار ما در این انقلاب زن زندگی آزادی است این شعار دو وش داره وش منفی آن نفی استبداد دینی و وش مثبت حکومتی دموکرات و سکولار ما خواهان چنین حکومتی هستیم زیرا فقط در یک حکومت دموکرات و سکولار است که زنان می توانند حقوق خودشون رو داشته باشند علت انقلاب که زنان در آن پیشرو هستند و البته مردان هم همراهی می کنند فقط به قطع رسیدن یک دختر نبود بلکه انبوه مطالبات برآورده نشده در چهل و سه سال گذشته است میدانیم که در سال 1979 انقلابی در ایران صورت گرفت که جمهوری اسلامی به قدرت رسید پس از به قدرت رسیدن جمهوری اسلامی زنان حقوقی که داشتن از دست دادن قوانین بسیار بدی علیه زنان تبعیض شد از جمله به موجب قانون سن ازدواج خیلی پایین آمد الان سن ازدواج برای دختران سیزده سال و برای پسر پانزده ساله به موجب قانون یک مرد میتونه چهار تا زن بگیره هر وقت دلش بخواد زنش رو طلاق بده و طلاق گرفتن برای زن بسیار دشواره همچنین زنی که شوهر میکنه بدون اجازه کتبی شوهر حق نداره سفر بکنه بسیاری قوانین دیگر این قوانین خوشایند زنا نیست زیرا بیش از پنجاه درصد دانشجوان دانشگاه های ما همیشه دختر بودند خیلی طبیعه که دختران تحصیل کرده چنین قوانی را نمی توانند تحمل بکنند. در صد شهر زن و مرد در اعتراض به روش حکومت به خیابان آمدند. برای اولین بار دختران دبیرستانی هم به اعتراضات پیوستند. به نشانه اعتراض به حقوق تضییع شده زنان در ایران روسری های خودشون رو در آتش سوزاندند بیش از صد زن سرشناس فمینیست زنان در زندان هستند زندان های ما پر شده از دانشجویان فمینیست ها 
نویسندگان هنرپیشه ها خبرنگاران ادامه این شرایط امکان پذیر نیست و همین مسئله باعث شده که مردم علا رغم مخاطراتی که داره مخالفتشون رو با حکومت ادامه میدن و من میدانم که موفق خواهیم شد و امیدوارم روزی شما را رو در ایران آزاد ببینم As countries around the world continue to take away the rights of women. Sometimes slowly. Sometimes in the blink of an eye. Shireen Ibadi, the first Muslim woman to ever win the Nobel Peace Prize, continues to fight for justice. This is a story about how quickly things can change, how fragile democracy and human freedom can be. This is a cautionary tale about one woman's struggle to restore the rights that women have lost, the women of Iran, the women of the world. Shireen Ibadi. until we are free. And we're back. So we will be presenting Shireen Abedi's film. Uh, it's directed, as I mentioned, by Don Gifford Engel. And uh, Don, I should mention this, it is a director's panel. <laughs> Uh, Don wasn't able to join us, but Don is the founder of the Peace Jam Foundation. It's a foundation she established with her partner in 1986 to, to provide a programmatic foundation, a vehicle for uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners to uh, work with youth um, in the art of peace. So her foundation's been going for quite some time and this is her first film that she directed. So we'll be presenting Until We Are Free at the Female Eye, June 8th to the 11th at Tiff Bell Lightbox. So I hope you'll join us. So here we are with Phyllis Ellis and um, Habibata, I wanna make sure I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Waremi? Oh, it's my first name, Habiba. Oh, the, first, the, the last name is Warme, but you, you can call me Habi. It's going to be, yeah, Habi. Oh, nee. Thank you for that. So I thought what we would do is we'll just continue with this change of pace or programming. Uh, I thought what we would do is I'm going to have each of you, I'll start with Phyllis. And Phyllis, I'm going to have you just sort of set up your film. I just want you to tell us a little bit about category woman and then I thought what we do is run your trailer then when we come back Habi Bada you're going to tell us about your film and then we will run your trailer and then we'll come back and then we'll have a conversation about with both of you about your work okay so Phyllis tell us about category woman Leslie okay. I, I will do that <laughs> um, so category woman is about um, women's rights, athletes' rights, and human rights violations in um, international sport. And um, the over 80 years of sex testing, but then focusing on um, a, an a event that happened with a spectacular athlete named Castor Semenya in 2009. And she's a, an extraordinary champion. And um, as Zene Mamgabi says in the film, some bodies are marked. And um, we, we follow four uh, women athletes that um, experience gender discrimination, abuse of power, um, forced medical uh, procedures, 
uh, and you know the uh, extreme violation of their human rights. And you know you you think about women disappearing and um, um, misogyny and racism and, and gender-based violence. And um, when you think about sport, you think primacy to bodily autonomy and this joyous space. And we're not talking about an autocratic regime on the other side of the world. We're talking about a, a, what is supposed to be a safe place for women. And we come to find out in the film that in this moment, in this time, in the global south, it is not. So um, that's that's the overview of the film. I always say to audiences when we're screening it, you know, often I'll say enjoy the show, and with this one, I say um, you just have to experience and live with the stories, and uh, that's sort of the the. Uh, the tenor of how you feel when you finish watching it. Thanks, Phyllis. Let's run your trailer. When you are a man and you do exceptionally well, you become a superman. When you are a woman and you do exceptionally well, you must be a man. Some bodies are marked. We have more now on a controversy that has erupted whether one of the runners should be in the men's or women's race. The gender that goes unmarked is male. With that comes rumors, I heard one, that you were born a man. Women are marked as all the ways in which they are different. There is a need for a gender verification, which is a long, complicated scientific process. They want to destroy her championship by actually calling her what she is not. The world is afraid of black female champions because a high level of racism comes in. This history of scrutiny of women's bodies have been created through decades. So they asked the athletes to parade nude. The women athletes. The women, only the women athletes here, yeah, not the men athletes. Who made them the gods that decide who can be a woman and who can't? They have taken initiative to do surgery on women. Asking those athletes to reduce their testosterone level or to create a more level playing field. It is hate mongering and manipulation of the worst kind. When I was in a bed, I didn't know what came out. I had guys under my belly. And I was asking myself, yeah, what's going on? It's the worst kind of human rights violation in sports. The fastest woman in India is going to take gold. Some of her competitors had complained that duty ran like a boy. To us, this looked like a case where there was a violation of human rights. This is not just about Castor. This is about all the athletes you've never heard of. Eventually, she was outed, and it was like a scandal. I was even to do a suicide. I'm not going to take medication because I'm not sick. Human rights principles are there to protect against discrimination. From a human rights perspective, that is essentially saying who is human and who is not human. How do you castigate a category of persons as insufficiently human? By throwing their gender into doubt. Wow. Great trailer, Phyllis. Thank you. The film is phenomenal. I have questions, but let's watch the uh, Happy Bada's trailer. Happy Bada, can you set it up for us? Tell us about your documentary. Absolutely. I'll, uh, so, you know, I was about to start speaking French. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Coron Musso Dixie says about women deciding that they don't want to stay victim of FGM, uh, female genital, um, genital mutilation. So, we don't, in the movie, don't just talk about, you know, the FGM experience, but we talk about, um, you know, taking back what, you know, what, what is yours, taking back your voice, taking back your body, 
taking back what society, the community has taken from you. Uh, and also, you know, uh, we talk about how we want things to change. Um, we talk about hope, you know, uh, and womanhood. Uh, it's, you know, women coming together and helping each other. So it's, there's a, how can I say that? There's, um, it's a kind of mix of, you know, uh, um, a bit of child childhood memories mixed with with the adult memory lives and memories and 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 the future you know what what kind of how the future is gonna be and why did i i'm gonna just talk about why didn't i make the, the, this documentary i did it because as you already uh you know already said i i had fgm when i was six years old and when i grew up i just you know I saw people talking about how FGM is bad. It is bad. It's not good. Don't do it. And, but I was like, what do you do with women who already had, you know, that? What's the option? What, what can you do for them? So, you know, I decided to try to find a solution for myself, you know. And I discovered that you can have surgery. I know it's not the answer for everyone, but at least if you can have this option, and you, you can decide what to do with it, you know. So we talk about this, you know, the surgery and the confidence and amazing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm in the movie. I had to be the big sister. I had to, you know, do the first step so all the women can lean on me and, you know, do the same thing. Yeah. Very powerful. Thank Very you. powerful film. Thanks. And, you know, I appreciated the humor in your film. It added brevity, the women, the laughter, the joy, the resilience, very powerful. And we're going to talk about that. Let's watch the trailer. Thanks. Ça fait longtemps que je ne suis pas venue ici. Tu vois la, la grande maison là, en béton là. Tu vois la maison au fond là, derrière les bananiers. Il y avait un truc qui était construit, un petit truc qui était construit, les filles étaient excisées juste là. C'est ici, je me rappelle exactement. Les traumatismes que j'ai vécu dû à ça, là, je veux tellement pas qu'une autre personne le vive. C'est pas pour, pour aller contre une culture. Il n'y a rien qui explique le fait que tu coupes le clitoris d'une fille. Après ma chirurgie, mon estime de moi-même a changé. J'étais devenue une femme qui avait plus confiance en elle. Il existe une chirurgie réparatrice pour alléger les souffrances des victimes. Mais la procédure n'est actuellement pas accessible au Canada. Je veux être une femme accomplie, une femme complète. J'ai envie de crier. Pourquoi pas moi? Pourquoi pas moi? C'est difficile d'en vouloir par eux. Parce que ma mère, elle, elle a été victime et avant elle, sa mère à elle aussi. Ben finalement, pour mon déploration, j'ai décidé d'aller au Burkina. Quand on se bat, on se bat pour le futur, on se bat pour la génération à venir. I just put something in the chat for you to say, you can enlarge the screen if you like, in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, anyway, wow. So I'll start with you, Habibata, if you don't mind. I have a few questions, and um, then we'll, like, we're gonna have a conversation, and I'm just gonna go wherever you guys wanna go. But you know, what really struck me in your film was you mentioned the reappropriation of your identity, your body, your femininity. And and that was and that was reflected by the other women in your film, and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that. I think it's something that women in the Western world we we kind of take that for granted. We're dealing with other issues. Obviously, sex is still taboo. Female sexuality is still taboo if it's coming from a woman. Um, but yeah, I was I was really struck by that um, by that statement. Yes. Uh... It's, you know, in, in 
those society again where you know FGM it's yeah female genital yeah FGM is it's you know still a practice uh it's a way for them to control your sexual pleasure so if you can you cannot satisfy one man you will not go around looking for another man um so uh and also you are because it makes you less than the woman, because you're going to feel less than a complete woman. So you kind of, you don't want to talk about your sexual life. And in, in public, you don't talk about it either. Because you have to be a good wife. You have to behave. Because the family name, you, you are like the, you can say, you are the one who is responsible for the family name. So you have to make sure that the kid are well educated. You have to make sure that your husband's name in society is respected and his family, of course. You have, it, it's a weight you have to carry around. So somehow those women feel like alone. And at the same time, they don't have all the body together. There's, there's something missing. There's, there's, there's a hole, there's, you know, there's a darkness somewhere this pain in each sexual you know activities uh there's a pain giving giving birth because depending of the type of the FTM you had it can be very ugly very ugly you know some women die because they can give birth you have to drove maybe two hours to go to the hospital you can die because you had FTM so you cannot just give birth you know uh so you know, you just you see the pain in those women's eyes in, in the movie. Um, just having the surgery, I, even if the surgery was in, you know, an option in Canada, just having the surgery is like going through pain because I remember everything that happened that day. And you know, going through that process, having the surgery is so painful because you're going through pain to repair something, you know, that you don't want to do it, but at the same time you want to do it because you want to take back something. So it's pain. You have to go through pain to have that. You have to go to talk to a uh, um, psychologist. Yeah, you have yeah, you have to go to talk about, you know, your family doctor about it. You know, I'm not good, I need this. So they don't talk about it. They just keep it for themselves or, you know, maybe they, they have some friend, you know, with who they can talk about it, but it stays in the community. So sometimes when you go to talk to another woman who maybe didn't have that in their community, you kind of feel the judgment too, you know? So imagine having the judgment in the community and going outside the community, having the judgment too. So those women feel like they, they are in, uh, you can say, a prison because they cannot rely on the family the husband don't talk about the husband because he want to you know uh, be the man so it's somehow it it's doing that for women maybe makes him be more man it doesn't have to give you pleasure you know you don't you don't need to be satisfied very easy i don't know if i answer to the question but <laughs> No, no, you have answered the question. I, I, was, I, yeah, I was really curious in watching the film. I, you know, there's a cultural imperative. Yes. You know, your mother said, "Well, this happened to me." Yeah. The, the, the story in my head of the 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 little girl, you as a little girl with other little girls being told you're not going to school today, and standing in a line and waiting for whatever is going to happen. And not knowing, you're not prepared. There's no uh, conversation. There is no uh, preparation. There's no understanding. And then there's no talking about it afterward. It's just, nope. right? And so it's taboo. And then, and then on top of that, yeah, it's just, I, yeah, you did answer the question. You answered a lot of questions. But uh, those were things that that really struck me. And there are similarities, and I'm gonna bounce over to Phyllis, because even though your films are very different, they 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 have a, a genesis, the seed of a, a very similar um, situation, a very similar uh, problem, which is the loss of identity, the loss of 
sense of self, the questioning of, uh, it's almost, it's just violation, a violation of self. Um, so uh, Phyllis, you know, there was a lot in your film. And again, I'm really trying not to spoil your films. <laughs> like I'm hoping, and we're doing a pretty good job, I think so far, I'm not like, spoiler alert. But man, I was not aware, it was it in your, in your film, you said that the gender verification in very various forms has been going on since 19, was it 1936? That was the very first official uh, on the record um, sex test. Um, I think the very first um, <clears throat> off the record, but in the newspaper um, was uh, Kinyu Hitomi in 1928. She was a uh, Japanese uh, uh, athlete. And they said she was the greatest athlete in the world. And um, her, her sex was questioned. Um, and you know, it all just came from being strong and powerful and and fast and and uh, accomplished as a woman athlete. Um, she died very young, and then Helen Stevens at the 1936 Olympics, um, at you know the she was questioned, and then from there um, it was kind of unofficial. Women had to go to their doctors, and the doctor had they had to provide a certificate. But then in 19, so that was around 1948, but in 1966, uh, they implemented what were called nude parades. So every single female athlete uh, from every sport, from every country in the world had to parade naked in front of uh, gynecologists, doctors, but it like, wasn't in like a, it wasn't in a, um, you know, a, a private clinic. This is in an auditorium kind of situation and they prayed, parade naked and they would check their breast size. They would sometimes do internal examinations and then they'd say, you know, your breasts are too small. You don't pass, you go home. Um, athletes didn't like that at all. And then they went to um, different forms of sex testing, only women athletes, not the male athletes. And th that was officially tested at the Olympic games from 1968 to 2000. Um, which I was sex tested. Um, they, they had different names for it, gender tests, sex tests, femininity tests, and it took different forms. And then you got a fem card and then you had a card that actually said, um, I am a woman. And you had to carry that, you had that fem card on your lanyard with your Olympic lanyard or your world champ, you know, when it, whatever you were uh, competing against or you know, what, whatever event you were at. And then, um, they had this sort of uh, meeting. The bunch of doctors determined that, you know, gender cannot be determined. So, sex testing was sort of wiped off. But the Olympics continued it, um, uh, and then um, certain athletes were identified. So, what happened was they didn't. They stopped official sex testing. What they did was they used doping to um, identify women and out them. So when you're doped or when you, when you finish a competition, you win a medal, you go, or random testing, you get doped. And when you are, you're, you, you urinate literally in front of someone. So the stall is open, you're naked from sort of waist down and they're looking right at your body. And if they're looking at your body and they see something, they see something, then they can whisper and say, you know what, Phyllis, I'm not sure, geez, geez, you know, maybe you want to run a test. And then from there, it went from there, then it went to, and then they were, you know, trying to figure it all out. And then they started labeling testosterone as what they called a performance advantage, um, which science will tell you that it's no more a performance advantage than Michael Phelps having um, massive arms or Usain Bolt having extraordinary, you know, really long femur and, or taco or one of the basketball guys being really tall, but they're not cutting off their legs uh, or their arms or their feet in order to have them to, to compete. Whereas you find out in, in the film that uh, some athletes have had actual operations um, for removal and also in the process of doing those operations to uh, unquote, lower testosterone to, to make the athlete not have a, a physical advantage, which isn't true. Um, they also did clitorectomies 
So they remove their clitoris, which is um, uh, has nothing to do with sport at all. So there's your, the, you know, on top of everything else, there's your, you know, your, and that's, that's, and that's to run around the track twice or to compete in sport. You know. So these women are champions. And it seems to me that by virtue of them being champions or exhibiting extraordinary talent, mm. as Semeni did, Sem did, is that where the film started? Is that, I'm curious to know what, what uh, uh, piqued your interest in this particular subject? Uh, yeah. Well, I, you know, I was an athlete. I quit. You know, I, I thought one day maybe I'd come back to sport, but I, I wasn't sure. And then I met Dr. Peoshni Mitra, who is the athlete's activist. And then she introduced me to the women. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when you learn things and you, you can't unknow them. And and uh, I just followed the story and felt it was a really important story. Uh, and I, you know, and, and as an ally now and standing in solidarity with the women from the global south that are experiencing this discrimination, you know, it's it's uh, important for all of us because, you know, my lived experience being, you know, white privileged from Canada, you know, I experienced, you know, my own level of uh, sexual assault and abuse and different things in sport. Um, but I, my experience, while you know, there's trauma associated pales in comparison to what these women. And just so to be clear, this is still going on right now today. So there's athletes being taken off the field. There's athletes in Africa that are being taken out, not just in athletics but in other sports as well, because these regulations hold. So, you know, I was speaking to you know some athletes in South Africa the other day, and you know, there it's happening today. So um, one of the, you know, you were talking about sort of the impact, but, you know, movie to movement and, uh, you know, we'll work really hard to, to use, utilize the film in, in whatever way we can and have it contribute to change in whatever way we can. For sure. Um, Habibata, has your film screened back home? Has your, in the Ivory Coast, has your film screened? Not yet, not yet. We just had our premiere here in Toronto. So I hope, I, I wish, uh, you know, I'm going to see. Maybe in 2024, we're going to have a chance to. I was hoping to go to Fespaco, but uh, they had a coup d'etat and, you know, so the NFB was like, no, you are not going there, you know, we're not applying. So I'm going to wait maybe in two years, you never know. But you know, I I hope and I wish we will see um that we will see the movie. I wish so. Well, we'll see it. We'll see it again in Toronto at the Female Eye. I know you just had your premiere at Hot Docs. You know what's interesting about both your films? It 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 it's shame based. It's very shame shaming. This both practices. It's, it's humiliating. And what happened to some of the athletes in in well the athletes featured in Phyllis's film. Um, you know, they're suffering for it. I mean, to have your identity, um, your gender based on a, a, a chromosome, you know, and, and really it came down to that, right? It was like if women had the, 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 the X chromosome um, there and they won and they were champions, they weren't, they were considered like there was something wrong here biologically, right? But men have Y chromosomes. There's men who have Y chromosomes. It's, yeah, no, it's it's actually opposite. It went off chromosome, oh, it went off, went off chromosome because you, you know, chromosomes don't determine right. sex we, or gender. That was originally the determination for sure. But the, you know, as, um, you know, Muntabe Ravel says in the film from South Africa, you know, the world is afraid of black female champions, period. Wow. You know, full stop. And, she, you know, and, and, uh, and Zane Mugabe says, you know, she says some bodies are marked. Um, the unmarked uh, is male, but women are marked in all the ways they are different. Black and brown and women are marked as insufficiently human. How do you category, categorize humans as insufficiently human? 
by throwing their gender into doubt. And right. these are, you know, she is one of the, you know, leading gender and race uh, authorities. Like my voice, my voice is very quiet in the film. And, you know, my, you know, sort of the impulse was just to create the space for, um, the, for the women in the film and the experts and advocates and activists, because, you know, the, the one really great thing about film is that there's all these incredible people all over the world that are working, but what the film can do is bring everybody into one place so that people can hear it really, really loud, really loudly. And they can, um, I did a, um, an interview with South African television in the middle of the night last night. And, um, the journalist asked me, you know, about this one particular person who quite holds quite a high um, position in, in sport. And he said, do you think that he would want this to be his legacy? And, um, you know, the, the big question is, you know, do we all want to be on the right side of history when we look at inclusion and when we look at, uh, you know, primacy of bodily autonomy, as I said before, um, you know, are you referring to it was Stephen Berman, wasn't it, in your film? Stephen was it? Stephen Stephen Berman? Berman is the 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 physician. Um, Sebastian Coe is the president of World Athletics. Yes. So who was it who said it's the biology, it's the biological sex, and not the societal or legal gender that must prevail? That was Dr. Stephen Berman, who was the official. Um, doctor, leader, scientist, researcher that uh, leading the charge and all of this uh, in uh, from their um, ivory tower in Monte Carlo, I think is where their offices are. So. So if it's not if it's not based on measuring um, testosterone, then is that where the hyper androgenism comes in, which is just such a bizarre Hyper androgenism is that how they're is that what's well that's you know that's really his term um, as Peoshni says um, the, the 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 and this is another quote but this story is complicated in the science and simple in the humanity right it's like why are we doing this right and um, these uh, are women and um, they are um, outed in their communities and communities where family, they're from tribal villages, religion is complicated, Christianity is complicated, um, it's confusing to their family and friends, they're shunned by their family and friends in some African countries. Um, their, their money is taken away from them. So, you know, when you think about, you know, what's at stake, um, you know, we talk, they talk about uh, the, the powers that be talk about level, leveling the playing field. Well, loving level playing field is having food, is having, you know, clean water. These women are feeding their communities. They're building homes for their families. They're sending their brothers and sisters to school. This is their their job, and this was their way out. Mm -hmm. Then return and help their help their community. Mm -hmm. it gave them a real sense of of pride, far more than for me. You know, competing for my country. This is like an elevate. You know, an elevated space for them to to uh, really do something incredible, not only for themselves but their family. So when all their money is taken away and their notoriety is taken away and then they have, you know, are suggested to go for surgery and they go for surgery and then they're shunned. And then the sport governing body says, don't tell anyone, tell everyone you were injured. So then she has to hold the secret. So then the shame attached to that, then she's in hiding, then she's outed and she lives in Uganda. Then she has to get out of Uganda because uh, you know, you can be, you know, killed or imprisoned if you're, you know, from anything other than, you know, if you're part of the LGBTQI community or if you're othered in any way. So then she has, she has to escape and then she has to seek political, 
you know, asylum in another country. And then she's then completely, um, you know, obliterated from her family and her connection to community and her, her country. So all of this because of um, arbitrary regulations that are not based in sound science. Arbitrary regulations. Yeah. Similar to uh, Habibata's, uh, Habibata, the uh, uh, FGM, uh, was it a, a, a was it based in religion originally? Was it was it a religious practice? It came it, it grew out of religion. This is what we do, or that was a question I had, or it's just more cultural. There's no right answer. It's it's complicated. So, um, some would say it's it's because Islam. You know, it it was you know you had to do it, it was obligate. I remember my mother when you know when I start talking about it, my mother she said, "Oh, it's an Islamic thing. You have to do it to the girl. Otherwise, you know, you will not be able to marry. You know, no, you know, to have a husband or something." And then after that, it became no. It's traditional. It came from Egypt and la la la. I'm like, okay. And I remember reading about it. I, I saw somewhere. Uh, I think it wasn't. Europe, they were doing clitoridomy or something like that to women some, t some time long ago. I don't know the time. So I'm like, I'm like, okay, so where did this come from? So it's a mix of religion. It's a mix of tradition. It's a mix of some, okay, some guys, so someone told me that when, long, long time ago, when men would go to um, look for food, so like uh, you know chase yeah chase the meat yeah. and something like that hunt yeah hunt thank you hunt they would do that to the woman so she would be in pain they would just cut a little bit so she would be in pain and so because you know when they go they can stay there for months you know one month two months so he have time to come back you know, so it's a way, it was a way for him to make sure that his wife would stay, you know, has, you know, she's supposed to be not going to see another man, not mine, you know, so he would do that to, for, to her. And I was like, okay, that's maybe makes sense for me. That's the point that makes sense for me. Start with that. And then after that, it became religion and it became culture and stuff. So yeah, it's a mix of all that. Um, it's crazy. You know, all those things start because a man decide that he want to control the woman body. So it's his pleasure before everything. So, well, it's, it's, you know, and, you know, do, by doing that, he's making sure that he have the control of his sexuality, everything. You know, he own her. That's crazy. You know. Well, you know, some of the subjects in your documentary spoke of that. They talked about, you know, um, how some men like it uh, because the, you know, uh, without getting too graphic, but they, they want the, the woman to be cut mm -hmm. for their own sexual gratification. Even doesn't matter to them if the woman feels nothing or, you know, if she's suffering for uh, the disconnection between, you know, for her own sexuality and sexual pleasure. I wondered, you know, how do the women, and I gather they're elders in the community, they're the grandmothers that actually are assigned to the to the cutting. And just so everyone who's listening, I, I, I know it's it's um it's a sensitive topic, but I have to tell you, you must not shy away from this film because there's there's nothing graphic, but there is so there's humor and joy and it's just, uh, you know, I really appreciated the humor and the joy among the women in your film. But, you know, the cutting, who do they sign up? Do they put their name into a hat? Like how do people, how do, how do the women who are uh, responsible for the cutting? And by the way, you know, it's not what I learned from your documentary. It's not just like, and we're just going to cut off the clitoris. It's like sometimes like, e -e -e -e, and they're like sawing it off. And all the women in the audience and possibly some of the men, we just scrunched our legs together really tight. <laughs> it hurts just the thought of it. Um, so who, how do they get hired? I mean, who, who selects these people to do this thing, to, to cut the young girls? So it's kind of like a 
professional job. So a, ma a mother would train her girl to do it. If one, if one day she died, her girl would do it. So it's a job. Uh, the many, there's some, some men who do it. There are some men, not as much as men, women, but it's a job. So the person learned how to do it and she travels to do it. So sometimes what happened that, you know, someone, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who know the woman who practice the FGM. So when they make, they, they're ready, if they have maybe 30 people, 30 girls or 50 or 100, you know, they want to call her and say, okay, we, you know, we have our girl, they're ready to do it. How much are you taking? And she's going to, you know, you know, tell her price. And sometimes it's, you know, it's, uh, it's money. Usually it's money. And she travels, she comes, she do it and she just leaves. And if somebody dies, it's going to be like, oh, she was supposed to die. She didn't have a strong spirit, you know, and you know, it's, it, it's that it, you know, you're going to die and you die. It's just, you're dead. You can do nothing. And the parents are going to just accept it and say, okay, you know, I had to do it. The community, the society. And, and usually that you're going to, some, the person who's going to bring you there, it's going to be your mom. She's going to go with you or your grandmother. She's going to go with you and do it. And she's going to maybe left you yet left. She's going to left you there and run. You know, because she don't, she doesn't want to hear you scream, and she's gonna tell you to do not scream because you are a woman. A woman is supposed to be strong. Yeah. Don't cry, don't scream. You know, try to take it because you are a woman. Then she's gonna run. That's happened most of the time. So you're gonna stay there. If you're lucky, you have your grandmother who's gonna come stay with you. Or usually there are four women who. Um, help the, the woman who does FGM. So for women, so they have to put you, you know, down on your back and make sure that you doesn't you, you don't move, you know. So those women take care of you for maybe two, three days and then you go back home, you know. So men, so at that time, what men do, they kind of run. They don't stay there. You're going to just go somewhere, go drink or, I don't know. They just, they want to be part of it. But if your daughter didn't have FGM, the cutting, she would not be able to marry nobody. Because that if if you have somebody that who want to marry you, his mom gonna ask your parents if you had the cutting. And if you did not you did, you did not have the cutting, sometimes that happened the wedding day. The the the, the mother <laughs> <laughs> your, if you didn't have the cutting, your your the mother of the of your future husband can ask you to have the cutting, and sometimes what's gonna happen? She's gonna bring with her the woman who does the cutting. So you would like it's your best day. You you're happy, but you're gonna have the cutting, and you're gonna go to stay with your husband. And yeah, so it's uh it's not well you know organized. It's just that, you know, you don't go to school. You don't, you think, you know, it's a great day. I'm not going to school. You go there, they cut you, and then you come home. And I think two weeks after, there's a little celebration saying, oh, you become, you became a woman now, you know, became a woman, you are pure, you know, you can go everywhere. You can talk to everybody. Everyone's going to say that you were good, good little girl. You're going to have a husband one day and you're perfect. Like you kind of, now you fit in the society. You have your place in the society. And <laughs> so, you know, they just, and after that, nobody will talk about it. Nobody. You would like, and your body, that's the crazy part is your body gonna have to make sure that you survive. So what's gonna happen? So you're gonna kind of forget it. Until one day, you something happened to you, and then you remember what happened. It is so I don't know. It's, it's something gonna happen. Just you know, as maybe a smell, maybe a scream, uh, maybe just 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 you know, it's gonna happen, and you're gonna start to have those flashback of what happened that day, 
and then you have to go see somebody to help you because i was listening to a woman saying that when she she remembered that she had fgm she went home at her mom and she asked her mom when at what age did i had you know the cutting and her mom said when you were three months i think three or six months oh said, yeah 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 so she she said she woke up one day she just drove she her she took her car and she drove and she there were and since there were no cars she kind of stopped in the middle top stopped in the middle of the road there were nobody police came she said she was she started talking i don't know she didn't she didn't know what she was saying so they had to go with her to um psychiatric uh, uh, psychi wait psychiatric psychiatric hospital psychiatric thank you oh, that's good for two weeks she has to stay there for two weeks because she couldn't believe that you know to a three months you know baby you would do that to somebody you know yeah. and she she you know she she went back there twice she she went back but you know the twice the first time two weeks and i think the second time she said almost three weeks and then after that she decided that she want to you know write a book about it because she have to get it out of the, her mind but you can't forget it it's crazy it's you can't it's it's traumatic and and even with the reconstructive surgery i would imagine that would be triggering right because again you're you're having yeah. a procedure in in a very fragile vulnerable area of the body so um yeah it's yeah. incredible yes you, you have to you have to give you know you have to go through a process and then you have to give um you have to give the opportunity or not say that you have to open yourself to somebody and decide that I'm going to accept this person to touch, you know, this part, I'm going to, you know, um, you know, give her my, you know, most, um, private, see, private part, my, like my most secret part, my, you know, it's, it's, it's like your, I don't know, your, um pain and the 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 bomb they put in your body and you've been you know fighting with it you're gonna let somebody open it you know and you know it's they will be pain you yeah. know you're gonna you know have to make to accept that because there will be pain and at the same time you know allow the person to go through the process with you you're gonna ah oh, it was hard for me so I know it's gonna be hard for everyone that doing that, um, but it's 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 um, your your body can kind of um, make it hard for you because the 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 pain the the um, it it you know after even after the surgery I know it everything is fine I'm I'm happy with the surgery I'm, but. I still have that in the back of my head. If I can say that it's, it will never go away. It's going to be part of me. It's going to be part of maybe it's, it's going to be a pain that I will never be able to let go. It's going to always stay there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to open it to the audience soon. We, if we have any questions in the, in the chat, but uh, Phyllis, I had a question for you. I have a couple of questions for you, actually. But the one I was wondering, what happened to Uh Yeah. Duty. She, she um, was able to go back and compete. Uh, it was just a, a, a moment in time. And then because they focused on uh, different events, um, and she's, she's a, a really extraordinary person. Um, and you know she's quite accomplished, so she's still running now. So. so, what is the for both of you? This question's for both of you. What is the catalyst for change? I know we talked about movements in movie, and um, Phyllis, that's a great, that's a great phrase. But is it uh, for you know? Is it having more women sitting on these for you, Phyllis? Is it about what 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 is it? What is it that's required in order for their for that for there to be change well i mean i think it's you know when you have a bunch of wealthy white men running anything 
I always describe sport, it's like the Vatican, you know, you've got the Pope at the top and then you've got the archdiocese and all, they all have their own autonomy. Uh, and, you know, they get to do whatever they want in their silos of world athletics and world field hockey, world soccer, FIFA and swimming and, you know, what all the different sports. And then until, you know, but then when something goes wrong, then, you know, the Pope's got to come down and go, you know, don't, you, know, you shouldn't do that. But when you look at the percentage over time, the decision makers, the, the largest percentage are, are white men. Well, how can white men make a decision about any of our bodies, let alone black and brown women's bodies? So it is, it is very targeted. It is, it is impacting BIPOC women, brown and, and black women, right? Right. It, at the moment. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the white women don't have to go through the scrutiny of gender verification or they don't, well, you have well, to get We did. We, we, you know, we, we've all been sex tested, but now it's more targeted. And uh, it's usually when uh, an athlete does exceptionally well, comes out of nowhere, does exceptionally well. A woman. I mean, notice, but you'll notice, right. right. Yeah. But you'll notice that when a white woman does exceptionally well, nobody's, you know, scooting her off and having, and just to be clear, these tests are not, um, you know, you don't just go in and have a little blood test. These are invasive, long, psychological, physical, emotional tests. And then their private medical um, information is, uh, you know, put all over the front pages right across the world. So none of that is, you know, none of that fits into what we think of as uh, what human rights stand for. So, um, you know, the, the, the question um, is, you know, there are, look, all Olympic athletes have advantages. That's why we're Olympians. You either have a really great lung capacity, you're tall, you're fast, you're strong, you have an amazing vertical jump. You know, that's what makes Olympians exceptional. Every Olympic athlete has an advantage over. And, and you know, it's, it's um, the idea of protecting women's sport. That's, the, that's their rationale. Um, women don't need protection. What we need is a safe space to compete. So provide that safe space to compete. And, you know... It doesn't mean that there aren't athletes in Europe and and North America um, that don't, you know, fit into or have a higher level testosterone, whatever their markers are. It's just that they're taken care of quietly. They're helped. They're law. You know, they, you know, we 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 do all kinds of things in the north. Uh, you know, um, whereas, you know. Uh, like I said, athletes like some from the poorest villages in in South Africa and in, in the in the entire country. Um, so I think that uh, it's about you know equality, inclusion, no gender discrimination, primacy to bodily autonomy, and and uh, and no sex testing. There's no man's ever been sex tested. I can assure you of that. Right. Thank you. It's, it's just about, it's about policing women's bodies, period. And I would say too, like ultimately, wherever the genesis of FGM came from, it's about controlling women. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, at the, at, you know, we, 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 we you know, so many things have changed and, you know, the world is a different place and you know what? Not so much, not so much. Right. And what I wanted to ask too is you said that the, 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 the surgery is not available in Canada. Oh yes. It's, it is not yet. Um, why, are, why is that? <laughs> because the technique when I was doing my, is not recognized, recognized. Yeah, by the the like association of gynecologists, yeah, of Canada. So 
you know, Pierre Foldes was the, the, the man who discovered that technique while he was going to Africa, you know, different country, you know, you know discovered that women having difficulty giving birth and having, you know, difficulty yeah. after, after giving birth. So he developed that technique and started talking about the clitoris, you know, saying that it's not just a small piece, you know, yeah. it's, it's bigger than that, it's longer than that, and, you know, and in France, you can have that, you know, you can go in France and have the surgery. The government will pay for that. You can have, before you do the surgery, you have uh, a group of women with who you can talk. You know, this, it's, it's well, like, well, well done. You know, it's perfect. You can talk to um, um, sexologists. You can talk to, it's, you know, it's, you have to pay, of course, because you travel, you go there, you, you know, you have to pay for it. But it's not that expensive because they make sure that everyone can have access yeah. to the surgery. You can go, I think, uh, I did mine. I went to San Francisco. Uh, I did it with, with Dr. Marcy Bauer. She went in France and learning. You can, you can go to, I think, Belgique. I know in Europe, you can have access to the surgery. In Africa, in some countries, you can have. But in Canada, sure. where where we do different type of surgery. I mean, you know, the perfect, you know, when you're looking for a country who does good surgery. Yeah. You can well, and also the multicultural nature of our country yeah. period that yes. should, be, should be available. Exactly. Um, so really you know, that, Phyllis, women, women suffer from depression. They feel, un, they feel incomplete. They feel shamed. Uh, they're, they're women who feel, and, uh, Habi Bada can attest to this, where they feel uh, shame, bodily shame, and they have a hard time, uh, you know, being intimate when it comes to being intimate yeah. with the men. They're, they're ashamed. Yeah. They're ashamed. They're missing this part of their body, and it's shocking to me. It's absolutely shocking to me that there isn't that there, there aren't the same resources here in Canada, given what a multicultural I know society we are. And the other point is, it it it's not, and this struck me. Um, in, in your documentary was it's not a um, it's not a, a difficult procedure but it yeah. is complex and yes. apparently in our country there are not a lot of of, of, of plastic surgeons who who can execute who yeah, well I can assure you if men had been genitally mutilated they would sure as hell know how to do the surgery sure. because they'd be lined up so yeah, they yeah. Yes. Please let me know if there's any petition or know. anything that that is yeah. you're working there. There are people who are ready to do the surgery. They are, but they have to go through the process. So here we have uh, Dr. Angela Dean. Uh, she was a panelist at the premiere, and she, you know, she wants to start something, but you need she need to have the permission to do it. So it's still in process. I have someone in Montreal too, uh, Elise Dubuc, who's working on that. But you know, they have to go through the system and it takes time. So right now, if I have women coming, you know, told me, oh, I have a lot of call and text and, you know, women email me, you know, they want to know how, you know, yeah, the, the process of my surgery and how, you know, everything. So sometimes when I ask me, do you know this person? And say, oh yeah, you know, I had someone who went to France and did it. I have this person here. So they would decide you have to, you need to have at least five thousand, you know, dollar euro, uh, euro or dollars, you know, US dollars to do it because you have to travel, you have to stay there for at least two, three days. You can just wake up, you can just wake up, you know, from the surgery and say, Oh, I'm going back to Canada. No, you have to stay there at, at least five days. So this is money, it's food. Uh, you have to pay the anesthesis because sometimes, usually, they don't. The 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 um, uh, surgeon doesn't take money. Even in San Francisco, same. She didn't. You know, I didn't pay. She just said, "Okay, you have to pay the anesthesis because you know they're working with me, so you have to pay that because we're using tools and stuff." So I, I think I paid two thousand uh, dollars U.S. dollars, but you know. Uh, and you had you had your hotel price, the, the the flight ticket, and you know the medication, everything, you know, and you have to stop working at least yeah. two weeks. So this is all that is you know expense you need to have somebody helping with. So when you you know 
if you do the surgery in Canada, it's easy. You just have, you know, a paper from your surgeon and you give it to, you know, to your, at your work. You say, okay, I have to, you know, take a break for two weeks because I had the surgery. And But no, we don't have that, that lot. You have to go wow. outside. Yeah. And, and you see that, that, I mean, you see, it, you know, those women sometimes have issue. You know, you go, you do that and you're way back. You have issue. I had issue when I was coming back from my surgery. It's not in the movie. I can talk about it, <laughs> you know, because I used the, the the bathroom from the the airport, so I had infection. So when I came here, two weeks, no, one week after, after one week, I, you know, I start, you know, I was like, mm, this is infection. So I kind of took a picture and I sent it to Dr. Marcy, and she said, oh yeah, this is infection. You have to go back to you go back to the the. Uh, emergency, go to the emergency, to, you know. So I went there and they kind of, they did the, um, uh, the guy gave me antibiotic and stuff. And at the same time, they used me as a, I don't want to say toy, but as a experiment. Uh, experiment, uh, because uh, I had a lot, little, a, a lot of uh, students who came, that, oh, I'm going to show the student, you know, what he did. So, you know, and he came and explained him, you know, well, this is the example for that, that, that was laying down my back oh. watching them <laughs> that's oh my god that was something and i'm like okay you 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 couldn't help me i had to go somewhere else to do yeah, it yeah exactly and, and then i thought well, then you want it but then you want to you, you know utilize yeah. it as a teaching opportunity thank yeah, you yeah then you use me to teach i'm like okay mm -hmm. maybe it's gonna help you know and the student was so you know you you i was you know saying that they there was something happening. Some students were saying, sorry, you know, they had to stop, take a look and take a note. And some would say, sorry, they couldn't even look at me and, you know, it was, it was sorry. Wow. And, you know, I was like, okay, this is, well, this is something. At least I had my antibiotics. I can go back home and, you know, continue my healing process. It's Maybe. a healing process. It's a constant healing process. Maybe, Maybe part of the advocacy would be like, you know, I mean, okay, the women you're in your film, are they women that you knew they were your friends prior to their experience of sharing their experience and then some of them having the surgery? I was curious about that. Or are they women that you just supported in their journey moving forward post? -office? I knew one woman uh, and I had to work with her to, you know, because she didn't want to have a surgery, but she had a lot to say. What you see in the movie is like a quarter of what you know. Right. But it was um I had to work with her. It's you know, it's a different story, but you know, and we became friends, you know, and because she didn't have someone to talk with about how she was feeling and she had so much pain inside. Oh, it's it's crazy. She had so much pain, and now she's a different person, you know, she can talk about it. She and so I met the other woman through her, the, the, the woman who did the surgery, I met her through uh, the, 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 the first one. And we became like friends, you know, uh, it's, we kind of have this connection. It was, it's instant because we're talking about the same issue we, we have. The mm -hmm. this, we had the connection because we're talking, about, it's, we had experienced same things. And, and she, you know, it, because I listen a lot. So it was, it's a way for them to talk about it, you know, because they know that, okay, I, I, I can talk about that without shame or without, without judging. And so they had someone that can listen. So we became, it was, it's, it's not easy. It was hard on me because it was a lot of, um, um, it, it was draining. Yeah, it was draining because you kind of listen to those women, and you kind of you have your feelings. Even if we, I had the surgery, I had the, you know the memories and the feelings. So when I listen to the story, it kind of connect with mine. So at the same time, I had to disconnect myself from my emotions. Yeah, and try not to take too much of their emotion. Yeah. you know, try to balance it. So it's. It was the beginning was very hard, and but somehow we kind of find a balance to that, 
and uh, it was amazing. I well, wondered, um, it must. Yes. I want to let you know, the both both of you know, we do have questions coming in. Oh, okay. okay. Do you want to, no, but Phyllis, continue while I scroll. No, I'm just going to ask, you know, it struck me when you were saying, you know, who takes oh, you and, questions. and uh, how difficult is it when the women you trust the most are the women that take you to this? Yeah. How, how do you reconcile with that? It's oh my god! It it's it's you know at first time it was pain and then it was it's I had different kind of mixed emotion and I didn't know I I didn't want to talk about it to my mom and I was like no I'm not talking about it and she, you know I don't want I don't you know and then one day I had the opportunity to talk about it because my mom. But somebody was giving birth to the, you know, uh, hospital and they had to do uh, um, surgery so she can give birth. And the woman, the, the, the doctor told my, told my mom that it's because the woman had FGM and FGM is bad that they have to stop. You know, my mom was like, I didn't do it. I just, you know, I combined her. I'm just here to help her. I didn't, you know, and they were like, yeah, but... We're just telling you, so you know, you have to stop doing that to the little girl. It's bad, you know. And she came home and she told me that story. She's like, ah, you know what happened to me? I went, you know, and then this woman was talking to me and screamed at me like, I, you know, I'm the one who did it to, you know. And, it, you know, it, it was hard. You know, she kind of think about it. She, you know, she thought about it for, you know, hours and hours. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm the same way. If I see the woman who cut me, I think I would kill her. I said that to my mom. And my mom just kind of turned and looked at me and she was like, she, she you know, she couldn't, she, she, she couldn't say what, she couldn't say nothing, you know. She just sat there and looked at me and I'm like, yeah, I didn't like it. And I'm not happy about it. And it's bad. It's why you want, you know. And she was like, but you know, at that time we did it because we had to do it. People were talking about it and it was a community and, you know, I had it. And when I asked my mom, you know, when she did it, she said, you have to have it. She had it, you know, so her mom, you know, and I was sitting there, I'm like, okay, my mom is the victim, yeah. you know, so all the, all the, the, the emotion I had inside, you know, it was like, um, but it, I, I was kind of, you know, what do you want me to say to my mom? I, I already told her it's bad in it, you know, it's, but she's a victim. And it's the first time, probably the first time in her life talking about it, you know, to somebody. So yeah. there's generations, fellas, generations of victims. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of the things Happy Body talked about was... Um, how some subjects they don't want to even the father of of one of the uh, subjects in her documentary she yeah. said my father didn't want me to to be cut and yeah. he cries and when he thinks about it i don't talk about it i don't talk about it and she said i didn't become an um an activist because i don't want to hurt my parents and also it's all contextualized within community so the girls who aren't cut are sort of like whoa you're there's something wrong with you you're not pure you're not you're not clean nobody's going to want to marry you and you know it brings me to this thought but i really want to go to questions and that is i i believe the movement has to start with men men need to be allies men in the community need to be part of this change because you can't do it without them you know mm -hmm. and I, I thought i just had so much respect for the fact that that they're, they're not trying to guilt out the generations that came before there's not i was kind of astonished by that that there was no anger and the other thing was well if i was that little girl i would go running away the minute i hear these kids screaming in this place um but i understood as you move through that it's part of culture it's part of community it's about honoring that which your parents want you to do and you trust mm -hmm. them so um, I, let's go to, shall we go to some questions? Um, okay, let's go to some questions here. So 
Um, I will scroll up. Uh, so, uh, okay, Jillian McConnell, what happens when a woman gets an infection from cutting or a child? We're talking about children, really. Like, if, if you're lucky enough to know that it's infection, you go to see a doctor and he's going to help you with it. If you're not lucky, well, you're going to have infection that can go very, very um, far. So sometimes they're going to try to heal you with a traditional remedy. You know, it's going to be the smell and they're going to say, okay, it's just, you know, she's healing differently. So you're going to have some medication, you know. And so some women cannot give birth, give birth because of, FGM. They cannot get pregnant because of FGM. So the infection can... It's, it's after the surgery or before when, when you get cut, right? That's the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you get cut, it can be very bad. Very, very bad. It, some women cannot give birth. They cannot get, you know, get pregnant. They cannot... It's... Uh, it's... Um, some die. Some, some, some girl, young girl can die after that. Uh, and or mixed with other disease, and so they don't see it, they don't even know it's that, and she just you know she can just die from that. So it can be very can be very bad for a woman having that. So for a baby, you know, if the parent don't know you have that, it's and it goes on and goes on, and it kind of um, put your womanhood in danger and, and everything uh, else. You know, it's very bad. Nikita Halawa, a question for Phyllis. Women athletes are synonymous with strengths. What challenges did you face as a director towards having these athletes speak about their vulnerability and bodily violations? The, what was the first the, the first bit, the first um, sentence? The first sentence was women athletes are synonymous with strengths. What challenges did you face as the director towards having these athletes speak about their vulnerability and bodily violations? That, that's a really good question. It, hmm. Or if it was It's a moment when, um, you know, as far apart as we, we are in, you know, culturally and our, you know, our lived experience, when I'm sitting with athletes and I'm, we're looking at each other, immediately we, there's this like common ground that's created with trauma or with, or with just an understanding. And these women are filled with strength. These women are champions in life to have the courage to whistle blow and to step forward publicly in a, in a, in a, in an environment where they're, they've been shamed and othered and, you know, excommunicated from their community. So to come forward publicly, um, this, this actually their strength was incomparable. Um, I think that for me, it, you know, the, just the sort of deep pain and empathy and uh, just, inability to 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 do something in that moment but um they're 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 cut down quickly and then they rise with you know in their fight so they hold on to that um that olympian um world championship power that you know, because sport isn't just physical, right? It's psychological, and mental, and you know you're very tough, and you 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 just play play through, and uh, you know each one of them. I mean, I think it's you know you have ebbs and flows as as you would with anything, but I think, um, I mean, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's not you know it was, it was uh, very very difficult. It was very difficult to keep going in and. And it, you know, keep going in and and and, and listening and, and just being there as you know, sort of a sometimes first time 
some of them were telling their story. Thanks, folks. Um, so, question about, um, okay, body memories. Uh, okay, this is for both of you. What are the most, uh, what was, or what, yeah, what was the most challenging part of making such vulnerable films? Or uh, perhaps making a film, films that deal with such vulnerable subject matter? What's your biggest challenge? Mm. Do I, I start? Yeah. yeah go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was putting myself in the front of the camera. That was, it's you know, it was, I, I don't like seeing myself on camera, myself on camera, or hearing my voice on, you know, the tape or whatever. So I had to put myself there. So I had to be vulnerable. That was like, okay, you know, because the, when we start, I start thinking about the movie, it was, you know, um, I was I wasn't thinking being on in the movie, you know. And then I'm like, okay, I want the inside view. So I had to be in the movie. And and if I don't do that, those other women would not talk about, you know, the life. So it was okay, you do it or you don't. If you don't, it's gonna be very superficial, it's gonna be, you know. Mm -hmm. That that was the big challenge for me. So I start being in front of the camera and, and uh, I think I, I'm, I'm glad that I did because it kind of um, helped um, have the, this documents where we, we have right now and, and create, it's kind of also helped create those discussions we have in the movie that those, those um, true and, and it was not simple, but um, real discussion. It was great discussion, you know, between women, you know, talking about sexuality, talking about, you know, how they want to, how they, they want the body to be and, you know, how they want the, to, to take the power back, you know, taking um, what have been taken for them. You wouldn't know that you were, that you felt extremely vulnerable being in front of the camera because you were very, you, you really grounded the film. Your presence in the film really grounded it for me as a as an audience as a viewer but it it started with your story so it made sense that you would be uh but you were very much you're very beautiful on camera by the way and uh yeah very much, very much at ease you seemed very much at ease and and you were extremely vulnerable in the in the telling of the story so you know thank you for that thank you thank you it's 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 i had to the kind of lead with with that and and you know and uh, it's still the part of the process because I feel like we have to talk about it and talking about it uh, start with those kind of thing we have to tell the people how we feel um, yes so they can you know they can know how we we're feeling like before right now but we have to tell our story. So it can be painful sometimes, but if you don't say, it, maybe people would don't know, you know, yeah. what, yeah, you know, what you're going through. Yeah. So it was it was my way, my way to start the, the documentary talking about my life, me, and then, you know, uh, um, being the the big sister. Yeah, you were the big sister. Karamuso, yeah. Karamuso. Koro Muso means yes. sister, right? Yes, big sister. sisters. Yes. yes. Um, Phyllis, what was the biggest? What was the biggest challenge for you? I think um, visiting, going to to be with one of the women and she had basically lost everything mm. and she was living in this tin corrugated tin hut that was attached to other corrugated tin hut maybe 
six by six dirt floor, no running water, no hydro, um, no safety, no safety. She was not safe. Um, there was, you know, a, a, a barely a lock on the door. Um, and when you went in, it was, it was uh, so, so she took such pride in this space. Um, so at night it's pitch black. There's no, nowhere to charge your cell phone. There's, there's no safety and it's isolated in kind of the, the, the this sort of jungle like area. And so you, you're with her for the day and and then you leave her and you're going to see her the next morning knowing so when you start to question like what am i doing and and then we immediately worked to get her a safe place you know mm -hmm. live. so to to just to highlight this is all because of sport. This is, this is, this, so when world athletics or when, you know, the higher ups that are sitting on the highest mountain with, you know, all of their money, when they're, when they're uh, accusing someone of something or telling them there's something they are not, it's not just a matter of, well, you can't run around the track. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, you know, you can't feed yourself and you're potentially going to be physically assaulted uh, in the dark. Uh, not that that doesn't happen to women all the time in different places, but I think that, oh, you know, yeah. I think that was the hardest thing for me. Yeah, I bet. Mm. Yeah. I mean, way harder for Eva. Yeah. Um, there's lots of comments. Um, tons of comments. Uh, just tell us the good ones. Yeah. Well. I'm, too, um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I just. I, there's many good ones. Thank you for organizing this talk. Looking forward to more. Uh, okay. Happy about it. One would assume and surely hope that your film will make great social impact. And when it screens in your home, how do you anticipate it will be received? I don't know. There will be for sure happy people. There will be some people who will not be happy about it. Mm -hmm. But at, you know, at this point of my life, I kind of I, I just you know, don't care if I can say that. I, I know, you know, the, the, there will be always some people who will judge you, who will say, you know, oh, I didn't like it, or I don't like it, or don't do it, it's a culture. I think culture is supposed to lift you up, you know, make you shine, not bring you down and give you an and and not give you an, an handicap, you know. Uh, uh, in the life who's already had for women, you know, to <laughs> navigate. Yeah. So, you know, I'm sure there will be some people who will not be happy, but oh, we're gonna, we're gonna take, you know, the risk in, in if I have the opportunity to show it to them. Yeah, I will, absolutely. Well, both of your films, what is extraordinary about it, both of your films and how, why they have such high impact are the character, are the people in your films. It, they're they're very personal stories. The women in Phyllis's film, the film, women it featured, including yourself in your film, Habibata. That is truly what resonates. I will never forget these stories. Uh, they they're indelibly imprinted. I can't unsee it. I can't unhear it. And I think it would be really if you have if there is anywhere a link, anything you want to put in the comment section. Can you? Can you see the comment section? I think you can. Can you see the comment section or no? Or in the private chat? Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking, um, what can we do as advocates, as allies? What can we do? Is there, uh, 
Is there an organization? Is there uh, surely the female eye? We're going to present your film at the female eye um, and promote it. But what can we do? What can we do? What can, more can we do? We have a, a page on the on the website, and the program is going to remain there for some time. Um, the the panel that streamed on um, YouTube will be part of our archive, our library. So perhaps if there's a link or something. Um, petitions, anything that we can do, uh, let us know and we will share that, whether it's here now in this moment or or after or after the panel. Um, but I really, I, I'm going to just take one last look uh, if there's any questions. Like I said, there's those, someone made a, uh, like, feel will have great impact. Someone made a comment about the babies. So what is the age range? We know that sometimes little baby girl infants are 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 not circumcised, but but yeah. 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 Um, and uh, but from what age? What is the what is the average age of the young girls who go through the uh, MFG? Hmm. Uh, I would say when I was six years old, maybe you know, like in in. Uh, before 20, 2010, the year 2010, it was, you know, six years, eight, you know, seven, but some, some country, you know, start, you know, uh, um, arresting people who practice, you know, FGM. I mean, some country it's illegal to practice it, but some people were still doing it because the government didn't, you know, do things that much about it. But when they start arresting people, then people start doing they start doing that to little babies. So what they would do be in trouble, go to the country where they can do it and do it, cut the baby and come back. So there's not really an age. They can depending on the family, it can be done to a one month baby, you know, two, three months. So from a one month baby to a 20 years old girl who wants to be married and the the the, the parents of, of the husband wanted her to pick up they would do it and and so it's hard to say i know this maybe this is it but i know there's um uh, now every eight minutes every eight minutes there's one girl who's being cut before it was every six minutes. Now it's it's every eight minutes. There's a one girl who's being cut. So it's really didn't change change that much much. But uh, there's they, they do it depending really depending of the circumstance and then the family they would do it to to you if you, even if you were one month baby they would do it. I and was they, told um, by some women that uh, they're illegally practicing it here in Canada. I, I was going to ask that question, if it's being practiced here in Canada. I heard that too. And you know what to say. If there's a rumor, it's there's true. something. There's a, yeah, there's, there's a truth somewhere in the rumor. So I'm very afraid of that. Uh, you know, they used to say to people that when we, we're fighting for women's rights, we don't have to... It has to be everywhere. We have to fight for every woman in the planet. It, yes. don't, it doesn't have to just be Canadian women because we live in Canada. Yeah. You know, culture travels. Now we can eat we, we eat Chinese food. We, you eat Japanese food in Canada. You can have food from every... It's a culture. And culture travels. So if they do in Canada, what's going to happen in, 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 you know, I don't know, in 20 years, what's going to happen? They're gonna still do it that here. What's gonna happen if we if we don't come together and fight it as women, you know, together and, and help each other? If we keep doing saying that, oh, it's a cultural thing. I don't wanna be part of it. Oh, it's you know, it's not here. It's from Africa. People, you know, we don't right. do it here. Right. And there's a three continent on three continent. They do the cutting in three continent. So if you you keep saying that, oh, it's from Africa. Oh no. Right. Don't. Here we don't know that you never know. You're gonna have maybe a baby one day with African men, yeah. and he's gonna travel to go to see his family, 
And somehow his mom can take the babies and go cut them. And it's going to be too late. Yeah. So, you know, we, we it's the, 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 the sad part is I feel like when, when it comes, you know, to talk about f- female fight and, and, and fighting for women right and stuff, usually it's stopped when it's come from, you know, when it, it, it usually stops in Europe or, 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 or here and, you know, I'm, you know, it doesn't go beyond those, uh, uh, big countries. It stays and we have that part of the country, another continent where women are struggling and yeah. it, when you talk about it all, oh, you know, in Afghan women, you know, are suffering, we have to help them. And you still hear people saying, hear people saying, ah, you know, we can help, but what do you want me to, to do? You know, it's far for me here. I can't do nothing. But well, you can you can talk, you can sign a petition, you can, I don't know, there's something you can do, you can contribute. It can be five dollars, you know, help people who are doing that, you know, yeah. fighting, helping. There's always something we can do. It is hard to, you know, take part and say, I'm going to do that. I know I'm going to help. It, it's, you have to take the decision and it's, it's you have to implicate. I first say, yeah, so yourself. But if we don't do it, we're going to, I don't know, I feel like as we're going to, it's going to be hard to fight for. We have so many, women have so many fights to do. Yeah, that I feel like if we don't put it together and help each other, you know, fight and do fight, it's gonna be hard. I agree. Uh, I agree with you, Habibata. I believe that we need to stand in solidarity for all women's rights because a, a, a violation against one woman is a viola- violation against all women. Um, you know, I was thinking about this little thing earlier about how International Women's Day is now International Women's Month. And then I thought, well, maybe eventually it'll be International Woman Year or International Woman Lifetime. And then we, where we were constantly, we're having these conversations and we're addressing all of these issues. And, and then I thought, well, what would we call it? We would call it a femdemic, maybe. You know, something that just continues on and on. But we've been living in for the last, <laughs> God knows how many years. But I certainly, you know, um, the female eye, we show films, I curate programs for, other festivals abroad, other sister film festivals, Porto Femme, uh, the Flying Broom in Turkey, I can't remember all of them, Beirut Women's Film Festival. So I will definitely be carrying your films forward, if you'll permit me, putting them forward. So uh, the festival circuit, the independent film festival circuit, and certainly Phil, she can speak to this. It is a really good way to to get your film out there and for audiences, the general public to see your film. That is where your advocacy begins. And then it's finding that way to infiltrate the systems that exist and then subvert them. So with Phyllis, maybe it's the 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 the, the organizations and the bodies that govern sports in the and you know big sports like big competitive sports. And with um, uh, Abibada, I just feel like the men need to be on society. It need, you know, you talked about your brothers and how you said to your brothers, you know, I don't want my nieces cut. And sometimes it starts small, but in a community, you know, it it spreads, and uh, it's just incredible to me. To isn't it kind of incredible that these things are still, these practices are still happening what year are we in 2023 i don't know it just seems just boggles my mind honestly yeah. it's happening in iran everywhere uh, but let us know how we can um advocate and support and i would like to um give you both an opportunity for just some parting words some final comments from each one of you phyllis where to find the film. It can be, where is your film going to be next? It could be, what is your next best thing? It could be, this is what you can do. Whatever you whatever you like. Well, the film is in London this week. I, I fell, so I couldn't I couldn't get there. Um, at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival in, in London, so it's there Friday. And then we're going to The Hague to movies that 
matter. And they, um, they think there's 70 films and they select eight and they honor the activist. And uh, so Peo Dr. Peoshni Mitra, who's just an incredible human, um, is the activist that they're, uh, that they're honoring. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's these, these kind of films, they take a while. They're like a slow burn. I've, I've been involved in a couple, you know, social, mm -hmm. political, human rights, um, taking on big somebody. Yeah. Um, you know, you're taking on a big culture. You're taking on, you know, years, hundreds of years of um, the assault on women's autonomy in, your, in, cult, in culture. I mean, that's a massive undertaking. However, you know, the other day when I was talking to the women in South Africa, you know, they were saying, you know, no more talking, you know, it's action. And, and you know, what is that action? And um, I think that, you know, it's even us speaking now uh, about this, now I'm going to pay particular attention and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sign anything or, you know, do whatever I can to support the work that you're doing. And, you know, please keep me posted on, you know, if there's anything I can do here, um, because it seems to me when there's specialists and everything else, and I imagine the population of women that have been caught in Canada is quite high. And I would imagine that we need it to be covered by OHIP if we live in you know, Ontario or other places, and it, it should be a given. So if we don't, if we don't have the capacity, then let's bring the surgeons in that do, and then they can teach them, you know, how, how, how to do that. There should be a woman's clinic in every city in Canada that's yeah. dedicated to, to doing corrective surgery and, and psychological care for women who, who, who are living in Canada that have, that have, uh, I agree. You know, I mean, I know I'm not telling you something you don't already know, but it, that's my, like, I get that impulse, like, right away, like, what can I do? For sure. So, um, yeah. You know, it's, um, so thank, I'm really happy to have met you, and uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing your film. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, we need more safe places. And, and so where women can talk about everything, sexuality, is, you know, everything. So yeah, we, we need more safe places yeah. in, in Canada for women to go, you know, and talk about the sexual issue and, and yeah. everything. And um, we are going to, to London too, <laughs> uh, but it's, we, the, the film is gonna be, uh, we're gonna be there from the 21st to the 25th, I think, for the London uh, uh, Human Rights Film Festival. And then after that, I think we have one festival in 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 New York. It's it's I can I cannot talk about that one right now. But we're going to New York too uh, with the film. And uh, human eyes, you wait. I don't know how, if they apply to the, for the festival here. I hope so. If uh, if I if they did not, I'm, we're gonna uh, continue the process and make sure that uh, the NFB apply uh, for the festival female eye festival here. Oh yeah, you don't need to apply. I mean, you you will apply. Well, I'll have you put your film on Film Freeway? But yeah, no, I'm I've already confirmed your film with both of you and with oh. Shirin. Yeah, no, no, I'm really excited to show your films. That was what was so exciting about this panel. I think it's the first panel we've ever done with filmmakers whose films we haven't shown <laughs> that we're going to show. I think it was great. Um, so I really want to thank you both so much. Wait. Abhi Bada, do you have any final words, thoughts for for us before we close off the panel? Oh my God, what can I add? Uh, <laughs> um, oh, so for, uh, wait a minute. What, what was, okay, if people want to, you know, learn about, more about FGM and, and, you know, how they can help, they can go to NFGM Canada. Does, uh, they have a, a, a website. And they have a, um, uh, I think they have a, it's the, the I think, wait, they in, it's in Toronto, I'm not sure. Anyway, they, they, they're in Canada. Like I think in every city they have a, a, 
some um, location in every city. So FDM Canada, you have in, in uh, the French side, you have Rafik, uh, but FD, uh, and FDM Canada is doing a great job right now. There's there also Women uh, Health in Women's Hands is doing some, a great job. Women uh, Health in Women's Hands? Yes, doing a great job in, 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 in Canada. Uh, what else? Those two, yeah. And there, there are many, but you know, when if you Google it, you you will you know see. Um, but those two, because I know them because I kind of work with them, so I, I know you know they're doing uh, a great job. But there are many, so you know, just talk about it, you know, and and you know, just help us. You know, I think we need more men uh, in our fight. Uh, we need them to, you know, um, be part of, of the, the process. The so, conversation. Absolutely. Well, we're all, yeah, 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 I agree. And, and yeah. it's the same for, for us, too. I mean, it's one thing for we, women athletes to stand and say enough is enough. But it is another thing to have um, strong men's voices at, the, you know, the upper at echelon of sport in support of this as well. I mean, the film, for, um, you know, it's on um, streaming on TVO. Um, oh. But I think um, if you want, if anyone's listening, you know, you can go to um, at category woman doc and make a comment and say, you know, you support the women. Um, what we are going to have, and I will have it in place by the time the Female Eye Festival is happening is we're going to have an open letter um we've been doing all kinds of work all over the world and um get as many women to sign the letter of, you know in the you, world great oh. and you can do and you can do the same happy body yes we we actually were hoping sending a, um uh a copy of the film to to uh, through the office you know to send it then you know ask them to to watch the 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 film and you know add the uh, some a note you know saying the film the, the movie with the, a note and see what's gonna happen to because I want you know uh I know we, we cannot swim the movie right now in Canada but when uh we have the the opportunity to do so we we invite them you know because they have to be part of the discussion you know that uh, yeah. So yeah, I have that in mind, but I didn't think uh, starting a, 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 um, a letter where women sign. I think I'm, it's a great idea. I, I think it's a, yeah, just an open letter, and you can put it on your website or you can push it out on social media. And um, yeah, can, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to deliver it to, but be the president of the International Olympic Committee. Not sure. Oh, absolutely. So I'm just take you know what else. We did uh, just before we go um, for Dr. Bruce Kidd and I wrote a letter to the Minister of Sport and demanding that Canada under human rights law do not allow any international sport governing body that upholds these regulations to, to, to not allow them to bring uh, a, a sporting event onto Canadian soil under mm. human rights in, de in deference in, and make a statement and for Canada to be a leader. So, you know, how we'll just keep pushing on that because all of these things, one thing leads to another and leads to another. And then in the last film I did, all of a sudden talk is taken off the shelves around the world that's and saving, yeah. saving lives. So, you know, that's how, that's how, that's how we can work together. You know? Absolutely. I, I, I don't know if I copied you both on an email at any point in time, but I'll be sure to connect you. Perhaps you can yeah. Get, show That's your friends with each other and, and stay in yeah. touch. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Leslie, for organizing this. It was great. Yeah. And, uh, well, thank you. And and let us know what you're doing, and we will repost and share on our social platforms as well. So keep us posted as to what what your next best thing is. And it was great having you both. I really want to thank you for your time. I'm sorry that Shireen um, Ibadi wasn't able to join us or Don, but um, I'm glad we 
we shared the video and the trailer, and we will also be showing that film at the Female Eye in June 2023. At so all three of you, um, I will see you soon. Thank you. All hey, right. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you for you. joining us. Thank that you. was great. That was great. Yeah, it was really great. It was really great. <laughs> it was. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.